welcome to my home. Enter freely of your own will and leave some of the happiness you bring. Count Dracula? I am Dracula. A powerful overlord who is feared by his people. And when they kill him, he comes back to life to drink their blood and has to be killed again. Yes, very, very familiar. We've all met Arvartok from Derry. Is there any fictitious character who's had as much impact in our popular culture as Count Dracula? I didn't know, but that you might be hungry. Thank you, that's very kind of you. He is very Eastern European, so much so that all the actors who have played his character in the countless films by Universal, Hammer and other studios speak in a parody of an Eastern European accent. But Dracula was written by a Dubliner. And what sort of influences all converged in the head of Bram Stoker to create the character in the first place? Many of them appear to have come from Ireland which, although populated by a complex cast of characters from the other world, who continue to live in forts and entice the living with music and come and swap babies for the Shifra, the changeling from the other side, has only passing references to the Nav Marav, the people who haven't actually died. The mystery is, how can the rich Irish folkloric and heroic tradition, which does not really feature vampires, have contributed to the imagination of the greatest vampire maker of them all. Here in the small townland in Glenollan in South Derry, we come to the core of the mystery. Could this be the inspiration of Bram Stoker's Dracula? When Shahrun Kechin wrote his History of Ireland between 1629 and 1631, he got access to some of the documents from the 8th century which recounted the tale. Avartok was disliked by his subjects. A king from a nearby called Cochon was hired to come and kill him, which he did, and he buried him standing up as befitted an Irish chieftain. Within a day, Avartok was back and demanded a bowl of blood from the wrists of his people in order to sustain his life. Cochon buried him again, and the next day he was back demanding another bowl of blood. The local druids advised Cahan, and he took a sword made of yew, killed Avertok, buried him upside down and covered his grave with a large stone to prevent him from rising again. That appeared to have done the trick. It is said about Avertok, as it is said indeed about others throughout rural Ireland, that when he was buried, the thorns were scattered around his grave. <laughs> Eugene Mullen used to tell the story of a group of tradesmen who came to move the tree. Their chainsaw broke when they tried to chop it down. When they tried to move the stone, the chain pulling the stone snapped. One of the workmen cut his arm and the blood fell into the earth. They said the vampire was drinking again. It was around the time of the childhood of Bram Stoker that Avertok rose again. The story was rediscovered and recounted by Patrick Joyce. Joyce described Avertok as a dwarf, used the story in his guide to the place names of Ireland and his history of the customs of the Irish. Although his 1880 history does not mention Avertok, as is sometimes claimed, Joyce was a member of the community who gathered in a fountain of creativity in Dublin, the homestead of the Wilde family, father and mother of Oscar Wilde, and a small group of folklorists, amateur archaeologists and etchings men, and Stoker was also a guest. The manuscripts in Irish were also being put on display as a nation discovered its hidden history. Stoker didn't speak Irish, but many of his friends did. George Petrie really wanted to be a painter, so he went out taking etchings of ruins in the Irish countryside. That led him to transcribe some of the inscriptions on the stones he found, and it led him to become one of the great early antiquarians. He was there before anyone else. When the Ordnance Survey hired him to draw up their first real database of ancient folk tales of Ireland, they sent him to County Derry. The project ran hopelessly over budget, was hopelessly late, but he may have been the first in modern times to reconsider the legend of Avertok. Droch Ola, bad blood. It sounds sinister. 
And of course, the word bore more than a passing resemblance to Vlad Tepes, Dracul, Vlad the Impaler, who was supposed to be an all-round bad guy. But everyone was impaling on those messy wars on the frontier against the Turks, including some of the guys who are now regarded as heroes in the countries where they lived. Emily Gerard, who wrote a book about Transylvanian superstitions, was a good friend of Lady Wilde and a visitor to Dublin. Her book appeared in 1885 and Stoker said attention was drawn to Vlad Tepes for the first time. Dracula simply means the lion of the dragon and Stoker loved the word. It was devilish and nasty and villainous. I am Dracula and I welcome you to my house. It led him to a book by William Wilkinson, an account of the principalities of Wallachia and Moldavia with political observations relative to them that had been published years earlier in 1820. He copied out some paragraphs relating to Vlad Tepes in his notes. William Carlton's story of the churchyard bride from a writer who grew up not far from the land of Overtuck. Joyce's reference to Overtuck and Slot Laverty and a similar tale from Errigal Churchyard in North Monaghan. Not to mention visits to funerals in the eerie vaults of St Mickens in North Dublin. Some of Bram Stoker's mother's family were buried there, a place with real preserved corpses in real coffins. Around 2000, Bob Curran reignited interest in Overtuck with an article in History Ireland. More media coverage followed. And scholars started looking at the influences. But it was to Transylvania that attention turned. And today, an entire tourism industry has grown up around Bran Castle, associated with Vlad Tepes. Stoker had never been to Transylvania, but that does not deter the tourists. The real Dracula might be under our noses all along. Stoker knew what turned on the theatrical audiences of 1890s London. His name was Henry Irving. Dracula can't bear good music. He doesn't like looking in mirrors. Whenever someone tries to paint a portrait of him, it ends up looking like someone else. They're all the characteristics of Henry Irving with whom Stoker worked closely. And a lot of people think it could be a thinly veiled parody of the man that he worked so closely with and whose career seemed to outshine Bram Stoker through his entire life. In death, it was going to be another story. A certain dairyman who lived and apparently died three times in the 6th century, all of 1500 years ago, would know something about that. That is, if he is dead at all. <laughs> Ha, 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 ha,